programme euh, euh, master dans le, en, psycho, en psychanalyse et, et société contemporaine et, euh, et l'auteur de, de très nombreux ouvrages et articles euh, d'orientation lacanienne et en particulier euh, dans le domaine épistémologique qui a énormément euh, irrigué euh, toute la réflexion euh, en sciences humaines et sociales euh, qui s'inspire de Lacan. Bien Dani, c'est à toi. Thank you very much. Tu appuies sur le... All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I first of all like to thank uh, yes, C.P. Bureau and uh, Gilles Arnaud and Benedict Dayen in particular for inviting me. It's a great pleasure, an honor, and indeed a great privilege to be here today. I'm very much looking forward to participating in these uh, two days. I believe that a copy of my text has actually been included in your pack, so those of you who want to follow the, uh, the text rather than just listening to me, you should have an opportunity to do so because uh, I think it's included there. Clinically disputed, yet theoretically vindicated. This is, I think, how Jacques Lacan would have assessed the current state of his reception and penetration in the English-speaking world 25 years after entering the Elysian fields. In times of evidence-based treatment, health economics and cost-effectiveness evaluations, the clinical practice of Lacanian psychoanalysis at least in the Anglophone world, is very much on the life support machine in mental health care settings. Most clinical psychology and psychotherapy training programs have already relegated it to the dustbin of cultural history. By contrast, Lacan's theories have gone from strength to strength in academic departments of literature, cultural studies, modern languages, linguistics, rhetoric, media communication studies, women's and gender studies, and film theory. Astonishingly, the versatile applicability of its concepts as solid tools of critical analysis is demonstrated in the widest range of disciplines, outside, that is to say, the traditional human and social sciences. And it seems to gain more and more momentum on a daily basis with legal scholars, criminologists, educational scientists and even classicists also starting to explore his work. I know of some quantum physicists who are interested in Lacan. I know of quite a few mathematicians who engage with his work. And I know of at least one chemist who regularly attends Lacanian conferences in the States. Sometimes I wonder how long it will take before carpenters, plumbers and butchers discover the value of Lacan. And after all, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this line, Lacan himself said at the very beginning of seminar one that psychoanalysis is not dissimilar to being a good cook. So if there are any aspiring chefs in the audience, maybe you can draw on Lacan in order to um, improve your practice. In recent years, Lacan's notions, and that's why we're here uh, today and tomorrow, Lacan's notions have been used quite successfully in organization research and critical management theory in business studies and in public administration scholarship. Many of the new Lacanians in these fields have demonstrated how key Lacanian concepts such as the divided subject, the object A, desire, jouissance, fantasy, discourse, and quite a few other concepts can be used productively in order to understand, amongst many other things, one, how organizations function and become dysfunctional. Two, how individuals operating within organizations establish their identities and develop certain types of working relationships. Three, how effective leadership comes about. Four, how work-related problems such as stress and burnout may be explained and addressed. Five, how strategic and operational change management may be facilitated. Six, how executive coaching and consulting can be tailored to subjective as well as collective needs. And seven, how organizational processes are conditioned by broader socio-political and economic configurations. If Lacan hasn't finally arrived yet in organization studies, then he's definitely making serious headway. 
Why did it seem to have taken quite a bit longer in organizational studies for the Khan to be conceptually assimilated? It's a question that quite a few scholars working in this area have asked themselves and to which a number of tentative answers have been formulated. In the editorial introduction to a special issue of the journal Organization, Alessia Contu, Michaela Driver and Campbell Jones stated, quote, it may have something to do with the maturing of organization studies or equally something to do with the complexity of Lacan's work that repelled early efforts at boarding, unquote. Now, as a non-specialist in the field, I can't comment on the extent to which organization studies have indeed matured, whatever that would mean. Unless you would see the Lacanianization of organization studies in itself as a clear sign of organization studies coming of age. Now, the hermetic complexity of Lacan's work is, of course, legendary. And it has frustrated and infuriated many curious scholars over the years, often dampening their initial enthusiasm and steering their projects in alternative directions. Yet Lacan's ostensible inscrutability hasn't prevented a plethora of people working in the arts and humanities from engaging with his work. And organizational research has intermittently drawn upon other notoriously abstruse French theorists. Now, introduction to, in the introduction to a volume of papers presented at the first Lacan at Work conference, Carl Sederström and Kasper Hudemarkus stated their own reasons for Lacan's slow and delayed reception in organization studies. Quote, While organization studies include a broad register of phenomena, the main concern is with the study of organizations. And as far as we know, there's not a single statement in Lacan's work directly addressing organizations. Second, organization studies, it's on page four, and um, second, organization studies have traditionally been occupied by questions of performance, control, and how corporations can be made more efficient, effective, and profitable. Such a starting point seems particularly incongruent with Lacanian theory, unquote. Now, the second reason here cannot but persuade anyone who is vaguely familiar with the development and critical focus of Lacan's thought. The trials and tribulations of the corporate sector don't seem to appear on his intellectual radar. Performance and productivity, although they could be adduced as accurate translations of Freud's term Leistungsfähigkeit, which occasionally crops up in Freud's work as a possible goal for the psychotic treatment, and you can translate it as performance and productivity. Now, it doesn't feature very highly on Lacan's agenda either. Critical voices may point out that when during the 1970s, Lacan unashamedly started to adopt the short session treatment, rather than the variable uh, length treatment, which would have earned him an estimated monthly income of almost half a million French francs. That was a fortune in the 1970s. <coughs> he was clearly interested in turning his psychotic pra practice into a profitable business enterprise. It is fair to say, I think, that whenever Lacan broached the issue of production and profit, as in his seminars of 69 and 70, it was not, it was not with a view to devising solid psychotic strategies for building the economy, boosting company turnover, increasing profit margins, or accumulating capital. It was rather to expose the social and subjective fallacies of these very principles. If we restrict organizational culture then to the classic structure of the corporate enterprise operating under economic conditions of high capitalism, Lacan must necessarily emerge as the anti-organizational psychotic theorist par excellence. Yet this in itself, I believe, does not explain why organizational theorists have been rather reluctant in adopting his work. Other 20th century psychoanalysts <laughs> such as Elliot Jacques and those working at the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations have been fairly critical of traditional corporate management structures and established principles of organizational development. Without them, therefore, they ignored or dismissed 
by organizational theorists. As an anti-humanist and a fierce critic of the adaptation paradigm in ego psychology and related models, Lacan was profoundly weary of any developmental, corrective, and accumulative perspective on mental health. And he was profoundly skeptical of any clinical and theoretical outlook that would regard the restoration of a patient's psychic economy and its return to a well-integrated state of equilibrium as a realistic aspiration. By extension, Lacan was extremely skeptical of any social system that inscribes progress and growth as the most advanced accomplishments. Because he didn't believe that the outcomes, that is to say the goods and services of a production cycle, can ever be fully recuperated into the regulatory frameworks, into the economic structures, into the organizational mechanisms that would condition and support the actual production process. Lacan's theory is not a theory of gains, benefits, acquisitions, yields, returns, dividends, and credits. It's a theory of lack, loss, waste, deficit, debit, cost, and perdition. <laughs> Whenever Lacan considered the possibility of gains and benefits at the subjective rather than the social level, psychically, yet also economically, it was always, always to emphasize that these returns are intrinsically flawed, essentially incomplete, and fundamentally dissatisfying. The most poignant example of this can be found in his conceptualization of the famous object A, object Tita, the object of desire, which was designated not, as I'm sure you know, the object which satisfies desire, but as the object which causes desire and as the object which simultaneously generates more and less satisfaction. Hence, I'd say it is correct that efficiency, effectiveness, and economy, if these are the hackneyed axioms of sustainable productivity and high quality service delivery in organizational culture, are anathema to how Lacan interpreted the force field of mental processes and the dynamics of the social bond. Yet contrary to what Sederström and Hudemarkers have claimed, Lacan did consider how the anti-organizational forms of lack, lost, and waste could be built into the walls of an alternative organization. He did consider how organizational life could be rebuilt, as it were, upon the foundations of incompleteness, as a non-totalizing entity in which hierarchical authority is balanced against a communal, libertarian culture of exchange. It is a crucial mistake to think that Lacan was not interested in organizations, and that this is one of the reasons why organizational theory has been slow in engaging with his ideas. I could venture the exact opposite claim, notably that it is precisely because Lacan had a lifelong uh, intellectual and personal interest in organizations, and invented a number of radical, almost proto-anarchist arrangements for running an organization that many organizational theorists, even psychological organizational theorists, have found his work rather difficult to digest. The major corollary of the thesis is that a genuine appreciation of Lacan's contributions within the field of organization studies should not proceed, or should not just proceed, from a demonstration of the critical applicability of one of the other of his concepts, but should start with a detailed analysis of the organizational theory that is always over, that is already present and operative within Lacan's own work, and which actually resonates with the clinical and theoretical scientific project that he pursued over a period of 40 years. Throughout his career as a psychoanalyst, Lacan accorded great importance to the study of organizational structures and institutional cultures. At first, as I will try to show, at first out of personal interest and curiosity. Later on, because he felt compelled to denounce the systems and practices which had contributed to be himself being ostracized from his own institution. And equally, because he believed it was possible to actually conceive of an entirely new type of organization. Now, all of Lacan's contributions here 
centered, as you would expect, on the specific organization of psychoanalytic institutions. Yet I believe that all of the concerns that he formulated in his review of how psychoanalysis is institutionalized and how psychoanalytic institutions organize themselves can be extrapolated. Can be extrapolated to operational, strategic, and managerial issues in non-psychoanalytic public and private sector organizations. As a critical theorist of psychoanalytic institutions, Lacan <coughs> occupied himself, one, with the recruitment and selection of candidates. Two, with the way in which psychotic training is delivered and monitored. Three, with how the end of a psychotic training process should be conceived. Four, with how candidates who have finished their training could be recognized institutionally. Five, with managerial processes of analytic appraisal, evaluation, and promotion. Lacan was concerned about the stratification, the hierarchical structure, the allocation of authority, the distribution of power, and the function of leadership in institutions. More broadly, he was deeply involved in setting the parameters for assuring institutional quality and standards, for guaranteeing the organization's normative task, for securing its social and epistemological sustainability. Although he was focused on how psychopolitic organizations function, Lacan examined how and where decisions are being made, how people get to participate in decision-making processes, how members of an organization are being appointed, how knowledge, information, and ideas are communicated and transmitted internally as well as externally, and how rules and regulations are formulated and enforced. All of these matters are, of course, strictly relevant to the study of organizational life outside psychoanalytic institutions today. Which implies, I think, that Lacan's ideas here have potentially widespread significance or may at least be entertained more directly in the construction of a Lacanian organizational framework than some of the notions I mentioned earlier on. Now, within the space of the paper here, I can't offer a detailed and comprehensive analysis of the development of Lacan's entire organizational theory. So I will restrict myself to what I perceive to be the key milestones and the central tenets. I will move to the next paragraph. In the late summer of 1945, Lacan spent five weeks in England during which period he visited Hatfield House in Hertfordshire, which at the time accommodated a specialized center for the rehabilitation of former prisoners of war and veterans who'd been based overseas. Still a psychiatrist, yet also already a psychoanalyst, Lacan was far from endorsing and promoting psychiatric interventions. But what he saw at Hatfield made a huge impression on him. He was impressed by the complete liberty with which the patients were allowed to move around, by the absolute freedom given to them as to how they wished to spend their time, by the non-hierarchical seating arrangements between officers and residents in the shared dining facilities. Believe it or not, he was impressed by the group therapy sessions inspired by the psychodrama technique of Jacob Marino. He was impressed by the diverse therapeutic program of open workshops and discussion groups and by the organized visits to local factories. Upon his return to Paris, he showered heaps of praise on this quintessentially English version of democratic psychiatry, as he called it. Quote, to evaluate the importance of this work, suffice it to say that 80% of the men choose freely to go through this gradual reintegration process, where their stay is on average six weeks, but which can be shortened or prolonged upon their demand. Thus, Lacan continued, psychiatry served to forge the instruments thanks to which Britain won the war. Conversely, the war has transformed psychiatry in Britain, unquote. There's a touch of hyperbole here, but I think you get the gist of Lacan's appreciation. Even more instructive than his experience at Hatfield was Lacan's encounter, a personal one, with Wilfred Bion and John Rickman. Two men, he said, of whom it can be said that the flame of creation burns within them. Unquote. Early in 1943, Bion and Rickman had been put in charge of the rehabilitation of demoralized soldiers in the so-called training wing of the Northfield Military Hospital near Birmingham. 
Now, rather than reinforcing the wing's iron army discipline and actively preparing the soldiers for their return to military service, which would often seem to result in soldiers clinging on to their neurotic symptoms, Beyond decided, you probably noticed, he decided to let the collective neurosis reign, deliberately refusing to intervene when things would get out of hand. Within a period of a mere six weeks, the atmosphere on the wing changed to the point where the men would start to take responsibility for organizing their own chaos, whereby they would actually refocus their energies on the accomplishment of specific group tasks and the management of interpersonal relationships. Rather than, turn, rather than treating the soldiers' neurotic conditions as individual illnesses, Bion decided to turn neurosis itself into the collective enemy, <clears throat> thus recreating a positive group spirit amongst the patients by recreating within their ranks a mutual, shared understanding of the destructive forces that threatened their common existence. To realize this goal, Bion imposed a concise set of simple rules which involved, among other things, each man having become part of one or, small, one or more small groups with a particular educational, occupational, or operational goal. Whereby the men would remain entirely free to choose which group they wanted to join and would also be at liberty to set up their own group if their preferential activity wasn't already served by an existing group. I will move to the next paragraph. Lacan thought he was brilliant. Speaking to l'évolution psychiatrique, he stated, quote, this is where the psychoanalyst spirit intervenes. The psychoanalyst who is going to deal with the sum of the obstacles opposing insight, prise de conscience, as a resistance or as systematic misrecognition, reconnaissance, and of whose maneuvers he has learned in the treatment of neurotic individuals, unquote. But he didn't stop there. Apart from complementing the way in which English psychiatrist Bion and Rickman, in this case, had succeeded in tackling the problem of war neurosis, Lacan also applauded the English take on recruiting new army officers, especially Bion's so-called leaderless group project, which he conducted under the auspices of the War Office Selection Boards. <laughs> Some ten candidates eligible for being recruited to an officer's rank were placed in a group without any specific indication as to its concrete organization or designated leadership. The group was then given a specific real-life challenge, which would only be achievable if the men found a way of channeling their individual energies towards a collaborative performance that was required for the completion of the task. As Bion put it during the experiment, quote, it was the duty of the observing officers to watch how any given man was reconciling his personal ambitions hopes and fears with the requirements exacted by the group for its success." Unquote. Neither the observing officers, nor the advising psychiatrists, nor beyond himself for that matter, were acting upon a position here of authoritative leadership, but rather suspended their leadership in favor of releasing the group's own internal dynamics and minimizing its capacity for expecting identified leaders to deliver shotgun solutions. Reflecting upon the experiments and justifying the idea of suspended leadership, Bion later commented, quote, the group always makes it clear that they expect me to act with authority as the leader of the group. This responsibility I accept, though not in the way that the group expects, unquote. In his subsequent work with groups, Bion would equally refuse to adopt a directive stance, allowing the group to evolve spontaneously, following its, in, its own internal laws and not only intervening when he believed he knew what was about to happen, which often left people feeling puzzled and bemused. Once again, Lacan strongly commended how English psychiatrists had made a major contribution here. But he was even more appreciative of the democratic principles supporting Beyond's innovative recruitment device. One, rather than someone in a position of authority recruiting and selecting new officers, candidates are given the opportunity to really demonstrate what they're worth, and therefore to somehow self-select and restrict fair play situation. Two, 
Although officers and psychiatrists would assess individual contributions to the group task, they themselves would only testify about what they had observed to a selection panel. So that theirs would only be one voice amongst many. And the final decision would be to a large extent based on what is conveyed in a witness statement. Three, the objectivity and validity of the entire process are driven here by the controlled administration, but not by the controlled administration of psychometric tests, but rather by the careful elicitation and rigorous evaluation of strictly subjective phenomena. Now, nowhere in his written text, nor in any of his seminars, to the best of my knowledge, did Lacan ever refer explicitly to Beyond's work again. Yet Lacan's major concrete contribution to organizational theory, that is to say his own foundation of the École Freudienne de Paris in 1964, and the pillars upon which it was built, I think were clearly inspired by Beyond's group experiments. Of course, it should be mentioned in this context that up until the point when the École Freudienne de Paris was established, Lacan himself had had a fair share of trouble with cyclic institutions not in the least with the International Cyclic Association, from which he was finally excluded in November 1963. And so the organizational structure of the École Fridienne de Paris may have looked very different had the institutions to which Lacan himself belonged during the 40s and 50s, had they been more hospitable to his idiosyncratic views on the theory and practice of psychoanalysis. We will never know. Put differently, Lacan's own perspective on what makes a scientific organization up to the task of fulfilling its function may not have materialized as such if he himself hadn't felt the crushing weight of traditional institutional power. I will briefly recapitulate the events. In 1934, while still in analytic training, Lacan joined the Société Psychanalytique de Paris which was the only psychedelic organization in France at the time. And he gradually made it through, way through, his, through its ranks, becoming a full member in 1938. After the Second World War, the SPP resumed its activities, and Lacan became a member of the so-called Teaching Committee. And in this capacity, he produced a paper outlining the procedures for the selection of new analytic trainees, as well as for the indicative contents of a psychedelic training program and the mechanisms for recognizing new psychoanalysts. The document, I think, was fairly mainstream, apart from the fact that Lacan did not want to exclude de facto non-medically trained candidates from the psychedelic profession, which it's been a long debate, which, which ran until uh, the mid-80s, at least. And he also proposed a certain decentralization of power allowing more members to participate in decision-making processes pertaining to candidate selection and the delivery of teaching. Then, during the winter of 1952-53, a conflict broke out between Lacan and Sacha Nacht, who was the president of the SPP, around the organizational structure of a proposed training institute, whereby Lacan's main reservations concerned the seemingly unassailable power of the Institute's directorate and the autocratic examination of the candidate's training by a sovereign group of self-appointed officials. In the end, as we know, Lacan lost out and was forced to resign, by which he also forfeited his membership of the IPA. I will move to the next paragraph. Now, after the first split in the French psychedelic community, Lacan spent 10 years delivering his seminar at Saint Anne as part of a training program of a newly created society whilst practicing as a psychoanalyst, entertaining people at Guide Cancourt and generally having fun. At the SFP, Lacan didn't occupy any important administrative or managerial position. Yet he generally supported the new organization's request to be considered for readmission to the IPA. However, throughout this period, Lacan also fired on all cylinders when considering the, cycl the cyclic establishment's practices and procedures, whereby he didn't let an opportunity go by to ridicule the institutional hierarchy and its rigid, dogmatic attitude towards, the analytic, towards analytic practice and training standards. 
1953, in uh, the Rome Discourse, which has been uh, mentioned earlier on, he stated quite sarcastically, that's the end of the paragraph, he stated quite sarcastically that the Institute's conception of analytic training can be compared, quote, to that of a driving school. A driving school which isn't content, content to claim the privilege of issuing driver's licenses, but which also imagines that it is in a position to supervise car construction. Unquote. You don't find this funny. I find this hilarious. Right? Okay. I laugh all the time when I read Lacan. It's, it's, it's so funny. Lacan's finest moment, if you, think, if you don't think that's funny, I'll give you something else. Right? Lacan's finest moment came in 1956 in a paper published on the occasion of the centenary of Freud's birth. Dissecting the so-called situation, la situation, right, of psychoanalysis and the contemporary condition of psychotic training programs, he painted what I think is a hilarious satirical picture of the distribution of power in the psychotic establishment which is worthy of Swift or François Rabelais. In um, the situation of psychoanalysis and the training of psychoanalysts in 1956, that's the title of the paper, which, which is one of Lacan's uh, least studied papers, uh, but I think also one of his most vehement repudiations of the hierarchical structure of organizations. In this paper, Lacan designated psycholytic patients as little shoes, a petit soulier. Little shoes who more or less comply with institutional and clinical rules, who don't really speak all that much outside the sessions, why would they? And who generally follow the path imposed by the soi-disant suffisance, the sufficiencies. That is to say, those in the organization who have successfully finished their training and who have been given full access to the psychotic profession. Psychoanalysts, as an institution would call them. On the whole, Lacan asserted the sufficiencies, actually they don't say all that much either. Because self-sufficient as they are, they don't feel the need to start a conversation or engage in a discussion. But then, there are the, there are the beatitudes, les beatitudes, in whom we can easily recognize the so-called training analysts, who have been appointed by the sufficiencies and put in charge as superior members of the organization of the truly necessary, the bien nécessaire. That is to say, those little shoes who don't come to see a psychoanalyst because they want to be re relieved of some kind of pressing personal problem, but God forbid, because they want to train as psychoanalysts. That's the worst of the worst. I have people who come to me and say, there's nothing wrong with me, I just want to train as a psychoanalyst. I said, this is going to take a long. I mean, that, that's one of the most serious problems that you can possibly have. Also, because you don't seem to suffer from it all that much. And this is going to take years. Okay. And it does, you know, in practice it does, right? Um, now, in carefully laying out the stakes of his elaborate exposition, Lacan conceded, and we kind of get that, he says, no psychotic society can exist without sufficiencies. You can't have a psychotic society without psychoanalysts. With the caveat that this essential rank, he says, can actually only ever be reached asymptotically, and therefore never be fully attained. So that a sufficiency can only ever be the momentary occupation of a certain position, and not the definitive realization of a certain professional stature. Analysts, in Lacan's book, only ever being able to approximate the category of sufficiency as perennial truly necessaries. Uh, which means that for Lacan, analytic training is never fully finished. And no one should ever have the right, let alone the duty, to say that he or she has arrived. Je suis arrivé comme psychanalyste. Je suis psychanalyste. So for Lacan, being a psychoanalyst is uh, is very problematic. You can act with your being, but you should never identify with a position as such, because it, it can only be reached asymptotically. Critical as the presence of sufficiencies may be for the survival of psychotic organizations, Lacan, however, was particularly disapproving 
of the sovereign power they seem to have, not only in selecting the truly necessary from the little shoes, but also in appointing the training analysts, the Beatitudes, and deciding which of the, of the candidates in training could be recognized as an analyst on the basis of what the training analysts had managed to achieve with them. In short, Lacan vehemently disputed the doctrinal authority with which psychoanalysts in the organization would concentrate power within their ranks. And he exposed the psycholytic establishment as a ritualized, ceremonious, and formulaic institution, not dissimilar to the self-perpetuating leadership of the Catholic Church. Could Lacan have anticipated, in saying all this, that the very organization whose self-serving rigidity he had exposed, i.e. the IPA, would proceed to getting him expelled as a training analyst some seven years later? Maybe, maybe not. Fact of the matter is that at the 23rd Congress of the IPA, the institution's central executive, there's a body in the IPA called the Central Executive, they decided that Lacan's group could only maintain its status as a study group if, and only if, a certain Dr. Lacan was removed from his functions as a training analyst. And so most of the pupils decided that the master should be defrocked. Much like the sufficiencies had at one point promoted Lacan to the status of his own beatitude, they were also clearly capable of deselecting him if they themselves were at least risk of losing their recognition as sufficiencies. On Wednesday, the 20th of November, 1963, the day after the deal was agreed, Lacan delivered the first and only session of his seminar, Les Noms du Père, ending with the pregnant words, quote, I am not here in a plea for myself. I should say, however, that having for two years confided to others the execution within a group of a policy in order to leave what I, what I had to tell you, its space and its purity, I have never, I have never at any moment given any pretext for believing that there was not for me any difference between yes and no, unquote. Of course, as we know, two months later he continued anyway. Or rather, he started again, with a new seminar and a new location with a new audience. The topic was the foundations of psychoanalysis. It was later modified into uh, the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, the concept fundamental lexicanalysis. Uh, but at the beginning of the first lecture, he couldn't resist, Lacan couldn't resist reopening a barely healed wound. And so he started with the question, En quoi y suis-je autorisé? What gives me the authority to do this? Or as the English translator of the seminar renders the phrase rather prosaically, am I qualified to do so? Now clearly, the problematic authorization here did not simply concern Lacan's position as a lecturer, but it referred more specifically, I think, to him teaching about the foundations of psychoanalysis. So it should thus be understood as what authorizes a psychoanalyst who has been officially removed from his training position in a psychedelic organization to lecture on the basic principles of his discipline. The question wasn't entirely rhetorical, but this, Lacan decided uh, in 1964, at least in, 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 uh, in, in January, that the problem should be deferred, but not for too long. On the 21st of June 1964, Lacan created his own school, l'école française de psychanalyse. And in the opening paragraphs of uh, L'Acte de Fondation, the founding act, he emphasized that the organization, l'organisme, but you can translate l'organisme as, as organization, I think, had been established in order to accomplish a program of work. I mean, Lacan talks a lot about work. Right? It had been established in order to accomplish a program of work, un travail, with three distinct aims. One, restoring the cutting edge truth of Freud's discovery. Two, Returning the practice of psychoanalysis to its proper duty, the used the devoir, and three, denouncing the deviations and compromises that blunt and degrade psychoanalysis. Although he didn't refer to Beyond's experiences in groups, Lacan thus set out in 1964 with the explicit goal of forming a working group, whose primary task, uh, son objectif de travail, 
consisted in a movement of reconquest, a mouvement de reconquête. And in order to ensure that this working group would remain focused on the task and would not, as Bion would have had it, resort to one of more basic assumptions, Lacan proposed that the work is carried out by small groups of minimum three and maximum five people, and an additional person, the so-called plus or plus, plus one. The additional person who is in charge of selecting the uh, uh, work topic, facilitating the discussion, and determining the outcome of each individual group member's work. After some time, the small groups will be expected to permutate, insofar as the individual members would be encouraged to leave in order to join another group. Lacan decided to call this small group a cartel, a name he glossed etymologically as being derived from the Latin cardo, which means hinge. It's important to note here, I think, that the cartel constituted a temporary collective effort around the accomplishment of a set of specific individual tasks from which the entire organization would benefit. So it's individuals working on their own program, coming together, benefiting from the collective effort um, without the group actually converging upon a, um, an, um, a shared topic. Being a member of a cartel was also a necessary and sufficient condition for being a member of this school. In addition, Lacan stipulated that whoever is put in charge of directing, be it the work of cartels or at a higher level the work of the entire school, would not be seen as occupying a chiefdom, a chefferie, on account of which he or she would then be given access to a higher rank. Mutatis mutandis, nobody in the school, regardless of rank and status, would be perceived as having been demoted if he or she engages in base level work. Every individual enterprise, this is Lacan's term, l'entreprise and personnel. Every individual enterprise, regardless as to the position the individual uh, occupies in the school, would moreover be subjected to institutional criticism. So that no hierarchical stratification would make someone superior or inferior. And a circular organization is created. This is Lacan's term, l'organisation circulaire which I think is, is, is a key pillar of, of Lacan's organizational theory. The idea of the cartel here is exceedingly simple, but it involuntarily reminds us of the leaderless groups that Bion set up when having to select army officers at the start of the Second World War, with the proviso that in Lacan's school, the cartels were not designed to select or recruit individuals, let alone to facilitate any kind of therapeutic results. I mean, it's not, it's not, it wasn't group analysis, but to contribute to the accomplishment of the school's primary task. Although the concept and the structure of the cartel was discussed extensively in the EFP, it didn't prove nearly as controversial as Lacan's proposals for safeguarding the quality of the work and guaranteeing its transmission. I'm almost done. If the cartel is the format and the mechanism by which the work is executed in the circular organization, then a certain regulatory framework is required to ensure that the work is also captured, evaluated, and communicated. What is required here, Lacan stated, is work transfers, a transfert de travail, which the, the term may very well be a, a so-called apax in Lacan's work. I, I haven't come across any other passages in his uh, writings or seminars where, where he talks about transfert de travail. He talks about Travail de transfert in, uh, in the direction of the treatment, but not uh, transfert de travail, or work transference. A work transference which requires putting in place a system that enables the work from the cartels to be transferred from one person to another, from one group to another, from the groups to the school, and from the school to the external environment. Traditionally, scientific institutions have guaranteed the transmission of their work by a strict set of rules and regulations, controlled by a so-called executive board, which sits at the top of an institutional hierarchy. But Lacan wanted to do things differently. And no doubt inspired, I think, by what he had observed in Britain during the autumn of 1945, 
and what he himself had experienced at the hands of the representatives of the IPA, Lacan decided to organize the EFP in what he believed to be, at least, a non-hierarchical way. Working from the basic axiom that a cyclitic institution cannot function without psychoanalysts, you need to have sufficiencies. Lacan came up with a provocative claim that the psychoanalyst derives his authorization only from himself. This is a famous phrase, le psychanalyste ne s'autorise que de lui-même. By which he meant that it is only the psychoanalyst's own analytic experience which can equip him or her with the necessary qualifications to practice psycholytically. And not, for example, the successful completion of a pseudo-academic training program, let alone the endorsement by an institutional hierarchy. Of course, many people over the years misinterpreted the principle as Lacan suggesting that anyone should have the right to call himself a psychoanalyst with potentially disastrous consequences. But in practice, I think, what he argued for here was the recognition of but one single criterion for evaluating whether someone could be considered a psychoanalyst and be authorized to practice. That is to say, what happens in the personal experience of having been through the process of psychoanalysis. Nonetheless, when presenting this principle, in uh, another key uh, text in, in, in Lacan's contributions to organizational studies, which is uh, the proposition of 9 October 1967 on, on the psychoanalyst of the school. Um, when he presented this principle, Lacan also considered the possibility of the school formally recognizing that someone had been trained as a psychoanalyst and was working psycholytically. And he outlined two avenues for this recognition. First, the school may decide to bestow the title of analyst member of the school, AME, uh, AME, upon those practicing psychoanalysts who have demonstrated their analytic ability in whatever form and without people asking for the recognition. Second, analytic trainees and practicing analysts may themselves ask for institutional recognition, in which case they are required to speak about their own psycholytic journey to three passer, passers. Members of the school who are roughly at the same point of their own trajectory and therefore equals. And who subsequently transmit what they've heard to a decision-making body, the so-called uh, cartel of the past, the cartel de la past, which then deliberates as to whether candidates should be given the title of uh, analyst of the school, analyst legal. Now, Lacan made it clear that these titles, analyst legal, analyst member of the school, should not be interpreted in a hierarchical way, as one being superior to the other but simply as different steps. The term he uses, um, gradus. So, so he, he substitutes gradus for hierarchical position. Gradus means step. Each with their own duties and responsibilities. At the same time, he also reduced the power traditionally accorded to the training analyst in as much as he didn't wish to differentiate between um, a training a analysis and a regular analysis. He didn't see the need for potential analytic trainees to be treated differently from normal patients and didn't want training analysts to have the power to decide or even to advise on how and when trainees should be recognized. So the recruitment, and so this is an echo, I think, this is an echo of Beyond's groundbreaking experiments with, with uh, leaderless groups, right? Because here the recruitment and selection of new psychoanalysts is not left to people in a position of authority, but candidates somehow self-select insofar as they simply draw on their own analytic experience to apply their skills, demonstrate their capacity, or satisfy independent observers. The actual decision-making body does not evaluate candidates directly, but it relies for its judgment on a set of non-partisan witness statements, much like uh, what happened when Beyond uh, was in charge of the recruitment of army officers. So did it work? Well, in light of the fact that Lacan himself decided to dissolve his own school some 15 years after it was created, uh, in 1980, uh, we may be tempted to respond with a resounding, no, it didn't work. Yet I think much like the Stalinist atrocities may not in themselves be a sufficient reason for discarding the great communist experiment as a failure, Lacan's dissolution of the EFP may not as such be a reliable indicator of the fact that the entire organizational edifice, the L'Organisation Circulaire, 
was built on extremely loose foundations. It's clear that Lacan's attempt to diffuse, or I said to dissipate, institutional power, it's clear that the EFP did not live up to the grand expectations that were raised on the day of its inception. In transforming traditional hierarchical patterns of operation into a circular organization, Lacan was firmly convinced that the work of the school could be accomplished. He was firmly convinced that the doctrinal inertia, which he thought was always looming on the horizon, could be averted. Yet the institutional consistency that he believed would come with experience did not materialize. Or it gradually transformed itself again into a more conventional series of arrangements with teachers and pupils, thinkers and disciples, leaders and followers, masters and slaves, you can say. It transformed itself again uh, into le discours du maître. Now the problem, no doubt, I think was to a large extent Lacan himself, who would well, whether he wanted it or not, he would always be uh, the superior Proudhon. The one who would not only stand out from the others on account of having been the one to found the school, and therefore who would also be in a position to legitimately disband it, but the one who was de facto intellectually unassailable, clinically infallible, and institutionally unimpeachable. Le plus un superior. Much like Bion, in his Northfield experiments, Lacan recognized that the school expected him, Lacan, to demonstrate his authority as a leader in his capacity as director of the school. Much like Bion, Lacan accepted this responsibility. And much like Bion, he sometimes intervened and complied uh, with what the group was expecting of him, but not in the way they were really expecting him to intervene. Yet this position, and that's another key element, I think, of Lacan's organizational theory, this position of suspended leadership, which is an alternative position of agency, you can say, closer, I think, to that operating within the discourse of the analyst than to that operating within the discourse of the master. And because the analyst, I mean, the analyst directs the treatment. So, I mean, Lacan is clear that the analyst doesn't direct the patient, but directs the treatment. Uh, and in directing the treatment, the analyst is in a position of directing. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's a peculiar position in terms of leadership principles because it doesn't fall into any standard categories of leadership, so you call it a suspended uh, leadership. Um, I think that position gradually, I, I wasn't there, but uh, I, I think it gradually changed again into a new uncritical attribution of power. During the late 60s and early 70s, Lacan complained a lot. He complained about the large following he was attracting, but he, com he complained even more about the seriousness which seemed to animate the audience. You know, he would say, look at me, I'm a clown. Look at you, uh, you serious bastards. Uh, there's no humor, there's no, there's no light-hearted uh, engagement with knowledge. So he complained about the fact that they were there to listen to him, but even more about the fact that um, they interpreted and used his own knowledge as, um, as a dogmatic doctrinal uh, uh, idea. The procedure of the past itself showed its fractures. New hierarchies started to emerge, and the work transference, which I said it's rather, did not always manifest itself, I think, creatively and productively as like I'm hopeful. Now, I think there's another way of looking at all this. I think there's, you can look at Lacan's decision to dissolve his own school not as an act of despair or frustration, or not as an act signaling his own admission of organizational failure, but as the intentional initiation of necessary transformational change. In order for the circular organization to survive, it must be occasionally dissolved and recreate it, especially at a time when it seems to have reached a standstill and at a time when the members of the organization may be least expecting or may be least wanting it. Why? Because of the, of the installation of a certain professional and socio-intellectual comfort. Like the work group, like the Bionian work group that is the cartel, the circular organization has its lifespan and must be dissolved. It must be permutated. It must be reconstructed 
in order to sustain itself as such. On the 11th of March, 1980, towards the end of his last, I should say his final public seminar, Lacan invited the members of his school to mourn, which is also a kind of work, by the way, uh, the work of mourning. He invited the members of his school to mourn, to mourn the death of their institutional home, and to become de-schooled and de-glued, decolli, is the word, decollage. So, uh, there's a pun there on, on, on school and, uh, and, and glue. Whilst at the same time announcing that a new organizational structure would be created, with the same structure of small working groups at its basis. This is quite remarkable. When you read the final text, he dissolves everything, but at the same time he said one thing remains, and that's the cartel. So if a particular development of the group spirit necessitated dissolution, then no dissolution here would stand in the way of a new group spirit. Now, in conclusion, what I've tried to show I'm sure I've spoken for too long. Uh, what I've tried to show is, first of all, um, contrary to what people have said, Lacan does have an organizational theme. Uh, Lacan had a lifelong interest in organizational culture, and for a period of 40 years, out of personal interest and out of uh, what he experienced at the hands of the officials of the IPA, showed on a regular basis his interest in organizational life, but also his interest in actually contributing to uh, the study uh, of organizations psycholytically. Secondly, I've tried to show that when Lacan develops his organizational theory, it is implicitly indebted to the work of Bion, which he um, uh, saw firsthand uh, in, in, in 1945. Um, thirdly, I've tried to show that the organizational theory, although it refers primarily, if not exclusively, to psycholytic uh, institutions can actually be extrapolated uh, bec because the principles that he adduces not only for selecting and recruiting candidates but for actually um, um, developing a regulatory framework can, can, can be extended beyond the boundaries of the psychotic in institution. And finally I've tried to tease out uh, what I believe to be some key principles of, of Lacan's Bionian organizational theory. Um, that is to say there is the circular organization, which, which is driven by the cartels, which doesn't operate with regard to a strict hierarchical system or um, uh, an established um, distribution of power, but when the decision-making uh, processes, uh, they, uh, they revolve around various uh, parts of the organization. But it's also a theory which actually requires every organization, that's what I ended on, to be dissolved on a regular basis. Uh, so, so Lacan seems to be saying that uh, transformational change to the point where, where an organization uh, reaches the end of its lifespan is absolutely necessary in order to avoid that an organization becomes bogged down again in, in the discourse of the master. Um, I, I, so, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that he believed it was entirely possible to build an organization from the discourse of the analyst, but he, he did at, le at least believe that it was possible to come up with another organizational structure where the discourse of the master would uh, not be as firmly embedded as it has traditionally been. But in order to do that, you actually, uh, from time to time, need to have the courage and the audacity to say, this is the end. It doesn't mean that, that uh, nothing will happen afterwards, but the organization which you've lived uh, until now will no longer exist. And only in this way can we guarantee its circularity. Thank you very much. Merci le professeur Nobus. Qui, euh, alors, euh, pour les plénières euh, des keynote speakers, nous n'avons pas prévu de session de questions-réponses, mais il y a une pause maintenant et il se trouve que Dali Nobus est parfaitement bilingue et donc il peut répondre à la fois à des questions en français et en anglais, peut-être même dans d'autres langues. Voilà. Ouais. Et donc maintenant, pour extrapoler moi-même, je vais donc euh, dissoudre temporairement cette institution euh, de, du colloque pour la reconfigurer euh, après la pause que nous aurons. Euh, dans le, dans le jardin, dans la cour, voilà. Nous avons un petit peu de retard, mais nous allons euh, donc nous accorder un quart d'heure de pause, si vous le voulez bien, et pour reprendre à 11h15. Voilà. Dans la mesure du possible, merci beaucoup. <rire>